dub it on later. It, we have to do white balance, that's right. Right. Um. You've got that dark image in there, is that right? Cartoon dip is a form of art, music, and philosophy which acts as a leech on reality and society. It waits in the wings right next door, not a million miles away from reality, then seizes any opportunity to leech off a particular aspect of respected reality in much the same way that John Wayne Gacy and Jim Jones had their pictures taken with Rosalind Carter. Like them, Cartoon Dip is using reality uh, to leech, is trying to leech off reality. The images for these pictures are influenced by a variety of sources ranging from advertising logo characters like Mr. Peanut and the S.O. Tiger to freak show posters which I saw when I was a little kid. I'm trying to create characters who have one foot in reality and one foot in fantasy. More than anything else, Cartoon Dip wants to break down the barrier between horror and humor. Cartoon Dip is right next door to reality. It acts as a kind of a leech on reality. Now, a cartoon dip is a person who has one foot in vertical reality and one foot in horizontal reality, and not a firm grip on either. Now, have you ever noticed how some people, uh, like retarded people or people from mental institutions, uh, don't quite add up? They, uh, their faces seem to spin in many directions. Their faces don't quite come together to form a unified whole. Usually, these people have no real beginning or end. They just seem to sort of creep into your consciousness, like Jim Jones, for instance. Before Guyana, no one had ever heard of him, but then all of a sudden, Guyana happens and he's in all the newspapers. But you don't really remember where you first heard about him, because some people might have heard about him before 19, November of 1978, and some people might not have. He just sort of, he's almost like a, a cartoon character who suddenly faded into reality, only he's a real person. and. The Nazi movement was similar, too. You had Adolf Hitler. When did Nazis begin exactly? Well, 1920, but they sort of like were off and on for a while. And then finally, in 1933, they came to power. And they weren't voted into power. They just sort of came into power. In, Ro in Robert uh, G. L. Waite's book, Adolf Hitler, The Psychopathic God, he brings out a good point how uh, Hitler's uh, face didn't come together to form a unified whole. The individual parts of his face just seemed to to go off in many directions. And that's because Hitler was a cartoon dip and Jim Jones was a cartoon dip. Um, now the ultimate goal, my ultimate goal, um, I've, as, you know, I've drawn these pictures with these characters in it, but actually one thing I'd like to do is to create a cult that would have 
such fanatical uh, followers that people would be willing to alter their faces through plastic surgery to look like these characters. Now, people you know, may see the characters now and they say they're harmless on paper, but can you imagine people, if they actually altered their features to look like that and to create a, a community similar to Jonestown, a, a very influential, uh, Jonestown is very influential on, on this idea. Also, Scientology, um, Unification Church, they have a thing called Boonville up in California where they brainwash people. And uh, another thing that interests me about cults is the way the leaders are able to create their own little realities for the cult people, for the people that follow the cult, like Jim Jones in Jonestown created a, you know, a whole atmosphere of paranoia and fear, which wasn't in, in any way connected with real reality, but what's important is that he was able to convince all these people that it was, and they believed him and drank the poison. Uh, and also, uh, the, the Moonies do, the, do a similar thing, like I've read books about ex-Moonies telling about how they were told uh, that deprogrammers beat them and stuff like that and are brutal, and uh, they believed it. And it's important, I think that's, cults sort of create their own cartoon of reality. It's a, they, they, they cut their members off from reality and they create their own little thing for, their cult, for the cult members, their own little reality, like Jonestown. But their reality isn't far removed, it's not spaced out from, it has some connection with, you know, what we, like they live in houses and stuff, or, or they, you know, they use objects, household objects that we use, and yet, but it's just the way, it's a little bit removed, it's right next door to reality, and that's what Cartoon Dip is, it's right next door to reality. It's living cartoon characters, and uh, in Cartoon Dip, in the cult, Cartoon Dip cult, we have a term called uh, living horror clown which refers to a person who's a clown in society, but they're horrifying, they're not funny. They're like a, 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 a clown of, you know, they're, they're a horrifying clown. You usually don't think of clowns as being horrifying. But look at John Wayne Gacy. And I think um, if you, one of, one of the, the best cartoon dip performances I've ever seen in a film is if you ever see the film Dirty Harry, the original Dirty Harry film, uh, the actor Andy Robinson uh, who plays the psycho in that film gives an excellent performance as a cartoon dip because his performance, it borders on humorous and goofiness almost. He's like a, he's almost a goofy sort of character and yet he's, he's very brutal and frightening. And he, what he does is he expertly combines brutality and goofiness and wackiness. He, like, he's, almost, he's like wacky, but he's, he's fr in a frightening sort of way. And uh, Hitler, you know, people would laugh at him and say he's a clown, but he's a frightening clown. He's a horrifying clown. Are the gremlins that he did? The gremlins, is that that new film? I haven't seen that, but uh, I don't know. I'd have to see the film. Um, usually, see, Cartoon Dip is wacky, but not in a funny sort of way. Like, when most people think of cartoon characters, like Daff Daffy Duck, for instance. People laugh at that, but you have to realize that Daffy Duck is based on lunatics in a mental institution. And all humor, in a sense, is based on lunatics. Like clowns originally came out of lunatics. Like when you see people, um, you know, walking down the street who are like insane people who've just been released from a mental institution or something, they, you know, they, they do goofy things, but it's, it's sad and frightening in a way. So you don't know. Or paraplegics, for instance, why don't we laugh at deformed people? What do we have, like, why not just laugh at a person who's like, you know, got, who's spastic or something? Because that's essentially what cartoons are. are um, that may seem brutal, but maybe brutality is a cartoon. And people talk about Hitler, you know, they say, he killed six million people. Maybe he was a performance artist. Maybe Hitler was the first performance artist, and killing six million people was his art. You could look at it that way. I'm not saying you have to look at it that way, but that's just another way to look at it. Maybe Nazis were performance artists. And people may say, that's brutal, but, you know, how, how far are you willing to go for art, you know? Who's to say? So maybe killing six million people, that was his, his art form. Maybe Jim Jones. I think creating a cult is an art form, in a sense. Like, it, it, it's, it's, because it, you have to, you have to deceive people and coerce them and find ways, and you have to look for a certain kind of naive misfit, a cartoon dip type of person who won't fit in, a person who's like, um, dissatisfied with vertical reality, who's just wants some kind of belonging. And uh, they're just people, everyday people, suburban people. What interests me, for instance, about Jonestown 
and people that follow Jim Jones is I've, I've read several books about uh, the cult that died and I just finished the book, uh, Wake in the Darkness. And like many of the followers that followed him were like ordinary people. I think that's great. They're just suburban people that said, look at this great guy, Jim Jones. He's a nice guy. He has, a, he has like black kids and white kids sitting together in his church. And he, wants to, he has this dream about building a better world. And I think it's great that people are coerced like that. They're naive and they follow that. I, that's why I admire early 70s naive liberalism. I like, uh, I like naive liberals. I like Sesame Street type of liberalism. I like that type of Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, you know, Moonies, uh, like the Moonies would have short hair in the early 70s, and they're very idealistic, and they fell for all these, like, front groups that the Unification Church would have, like creative community projects, or uh, they had one called CARP, Collegiate Association for Research of Principle, and I like the idea that they don't, um, the Unification Church doesn't tell its members, it deceives them, it lures them in with these front groups, and, and it's very ambiguous. Like, if you ever hear Mose Durst, the president of Unification Church, talk, he talks in a very rhetorical, ambiguous sort of way that says a whole lot of nothing. He doesn't really say anything. Like, if people ask him questions and stuff, and it sort of hypnotizes people. And I like that, that idealism, that naive idealism. Well, why do people do that? Why do people give up their individuality? I mean, they give up their whole personality. Because they want to be a part of something. like. You have to examine the people on, on, on an individual level. You have to say, like, the, like I'll take a case in point. Um, there was these people that followed Jim Jones, a family of people, the Myrtles. They later changed their name to uh, the Mills after Jonestown. But the Myrtles, and they were just these dippy people. They were, they were very lonely. They didn't have any friends. And they had a family, and they were having trouble with their marriage. They were just very suburban people. And one day, they went up to, in 1966, this is long before anyone knew about Jim Jones. They thought he was a great guy, and, you know. And they went up to his church, and they said, "Wow, this is a great church. You know, look at what Jim Jones." And Jim Jones was very friendly to them, and he came down. And he personally put his arms around. Love bombing is another thing I like. The, the Moonies do that a lot. They they put their arms around you, and it's like, "Oh, come, you know, welcome in, brother. You know, love, love, and all this." And and they reduce you to like a child. Like if you studied the Unification Church. Things, they make it very childlike and like they give you a person that follows you around even when you go to the bathroom and he talks to you he they don't let you sleep and what they're doing is they're trying to make you like submissive like a little kid and they treat you like a little kid like they they have you do chants and stuff dodgeball chants and like they do a thing called the choo choo it's a secret Mooney ritual I don't know if you've heard of it but what they do is they do this thing where they grab your hand and they jump up and down and go, yeah, 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 choo-choo, pow, or something like that, or choo-choo, choo-choo. And it's a, a name gibberish, but it, it's deadly. What its effect is, it seems like a childish, funny thing, but what they're trying to do is get you to, to be like, you know, you jump up and down, and, and to be sub it makes you submissive, and they have you play dodgeball and stuff, and chant while you chant, you know, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, and sing and stuff, and the singing, if you don't sing, they encourage you to sing, like they push you and say, come on, sing, and you're like, and when you're in a big crowd like that, you know, you're, you tend to meld in with the crowd. And, uh, but as the cults are an art form, I think, I think the real artists of the 20th century are Reverend Sung Young Moon, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, Jim Jones. They're artists, that's a form of performance art. And uh, a lot of people may not see it, but that's just that's one way of looking at it. And. Uh, With horror. Well, I've always been fascinated with horror. As far back as I can remember, when I was a little kid, we'd go to the fair and um, we'd look at the, there'd be the freak show posters in the back. And I always liked the fact that they were lured, like they'd show people that were deformed and they're painted in a certain way. So that was almost like characters. They weren't full, because the artists weren't very good, I guess. So they could only do like characters. But I liked that. There was like lured, like they and the barker would be out front, and he'd be like barking through this horrible microphone, saying like, come see the man with it. And it'd be very frightening, but at the same time, it fascinated me, because I knew that the freaks inside there weren't as horrible as the pictures. So you just go in there, and you see these mundane freaks, like I saw the lobster man. He was just a guy who had like, you know, his hand went whoosh, like that, and uh, his feet were like that too, and he, could, he said, I am the lobster man. But he wasn't, he was just a very mundane guy, but something really awful was happening to him. And his whole family was like that. And he pointed to a picture and said, look, this is my family. They're all like that. 
somewhat, you know, suburban family, except they have lobster claws, very mundane people, yet it's something really unusual happening to them. And a lot of people, you know, don't think that uh, horror is mundane. That I guess a, a lot of people see horror as flashy and something frightening, but to me it's more just like sort of dippy, you know, it just hangs there. It's very mundane horror. How can you say that? It is, but you've got to look at it that way. You've got to look at horror as, as being something mundane. It's not something frightening. Like, when you're frightened, I think that's just another thing, you know, like it's like when you laugh. Yeah, the Nazis were all very middle class. Right. Very mundane people. Like everyday average people and they're just brutal, that's all. Like for instance, okay, like, well, it's interesting, for instance, I, I was talking about horror and humor being broke. Well, horror, humor comes from horror because what, what, horror, what um, horror is, or humor actually, is when you're, fright, you're confused by something, you look at it and you say, that's confusing, and you laugh at it because it's so ridiculous. But what's happening is there's a pause there where you're trying to figure it out, and what happens is you have to fill in that gap with something so you laugh, like, ha, ha, ha. That's, but really, it's a form of horror. Uh, humor first came from horror, that way back, you know, the caveman times, they traced it back, and it's really, so, it's a, it's a branch, it branches out from, so I see them as being two of the same thing, humor and horror, horror and humor, and... Um, They're distinct in the movies, though, I mean, people go to Exactly, movies but movies aren't like... Comedies, and they, they, they claim not to like the other. Exactly, but see, I think movies are too flashy, they don't portray life like, like, I like the mundane movies, I don't like flashy movies. My favorite movies are just, like Moonchild is my favorite movie. What they did with that is they took a bunch of ex-moonies and had them replay their, their uh, like they had them reenact their brainwashing and they couldn't act and I like that, the fact that they're very stiff. I like stiff actors who are like cardboard zombie-like people that can't act. And like here were these moony people reenacting their brainwashing and then at the end they had some like really awful off-key folk singer singing a song about, it was great, I was like, well, there are many roads to travel and we get lost along the way. I thought that was great, it was very mundane. And what was happening is, you see like this, you know, this, these people like went through this thing and they were deprogrammed and yet they're willing to reenact it. And at the end, they, they, they showed them all and they're like this, you know, they froze them and then they'd have like John Smith, 19, June 1972 until June 1977. And, uh, you know, that's how long he was in the cult. I think that, that, that was my favorite film. And it's interesting, like the Moonies were ahead of their time in that in the early 70s, they had short hair, you know what I'm saying? Long before anyone else did, really. I mean, and people look down their nose at them and say, Moonies, uh, pff, you know, new wave is the big thing now, and look at all these people. But the Moonies had short hair back in, say, 1972, and you, you take people like, uh, and like people on Sesame Street, they had that sort of, idealistic liberalism and I think people that would have short hair in 72 or skin their head like the Manson family skin their head in 69 which was years ahead of his time or, or people like that are more ahead of their time you know and um, the Beach Boys shaved their heads in 1964 yeah and Henry Lee Lucas the mass murderer in 60 in 1960 had hair sticking up from here but you can go but um, and of course the Pied Piper of Tucson another mass murderer used to uh, dye his hair this was in the mid '60s. He had like orange, orange hair, and he dyed it black. And he, he put in, like he put axle grease on his face to give himself a false mole. He was a very cartoon dip person. I wish I had a picture of him. If you could see him, like he added pieces of plastic onto his face to make it so he's like half a person, half a real person, half a dummy, a mannequin. He put like he had a plastic thing on his nose. He looked really strange. If you, you could see this guy, he was like off center, off center. That's an important thing to remember. Because in Tucson, you had a following of teenagers, and it, it's sort of like Manson, before Manson, back in 1965, and around the, the beat, well, I don't know, if that was after the beatniks, but it was more like, you know, kids along the strip, this certain strip in Arizona, follow this guy, he's a real eccentric character. His name was, um, oh, I can't think of the Piper, I can't think of his name, but um, he, uh, he had a following of teenagers, and he murdered these two girls. He just wanted to see if he could murder a girl and get away with it, but they caught him. And there's a picture in one of this book I, this book I have about him where it shows him pointing to the skull where the girl was. But, uh, so, what was it, horror, yeah. Horror and humor are really one and the same thing, I think.
freak shows and, and if you notice like if you live in the suburbs it's important to live in the suburbs I think because and you grow up in a very mundane sort of atmosphere and you realize that when something awful happens you just like go down to your grocery store and uh, read about it in, in a lurid you know cr true crime magazine you say so what and uh, Okay, uh, I couldn't think of the Pied Piper of Tucson's name, but his name was Charles Schmidt, and um, he was caught in 1965, and then they put him in jail, and then he escaped with another convict in 1972, and he took this family hostage on a ranch, but uh, one of the guys was caught, but he got away for a while, and he put on a blonde curly wig, because he thought by wearing this wig he could evade the police, and he jumped on a train, but he didn't get away, so... Well, right, um, I was talking about early 70s liberalism and short-haired. There's a certain brand of liberalism, and I'm, I'm trying to write a book about it now, called Early 70s Short-Haired Liberalism. And uh, I'd like to plug uh, one guy. This is a plug. This fellow has never gotten any credit, and his name is Jonathan Richmond, and he's a musician. And in 1972, now, we're not talking 1977, you know, at the height of the punk movement or anything. We're talking 1972, back when everyone had long hair. This guy had short hair, and he, walked, he sang songs. He sang a song called I'm Straight in front of hippie audiences. And for, in 1972, for him to do that was years ahead of his time, and he recorded an album, which I would like to plug right now, and I hope whoever sees this goes out and buys this album. This man lives in Boston. He's in, I've seen him live, and... I wanted to meet him and shake his hand, but I couldn't because uh, it was a packed like bar, you know, there's a lot of people around in front of the stage, but he, um, he recorded an album called, the, he had a band called the Original Modern Lovers, the Modern Lovers, in 1972, in the early 70s, and he, he, um, he originally wanted to call the band Dance Band of the Highway, and he believed, his philosophy was, he, he, he sang about in his songs, horizontal philosophy. He said, it's all horizontal. And that's sort of influenced me. And also, he said that when he started this band in 1972, he wanted to play in Howard Johnson's lobbies and very mundane places like that. You know, Howard Johnson's gas stations, parking lots. He wanted to, and he, he was really ahead of his time. And another uh, people that I'd like to uh, plug that I don't think have gotten any credit are the Shags, these sisters from New Hampshire, the Wigan sisters. Betty, Dorothy, and Helen, and um, they put out a, they recorded an album. Their father, who's just an ordinary mundane laborer, dragged them into a studio in New Hampshire in, I think, 69, and he recorded an album, and the tapes are lost, and then they were later discovered, and um, they made an album, and then a few years later, they, they have a, another album out, the Shag's own thing, and the cover shows, they're very, a the thing I like about them is that they're not flashy, you know, they don't look at all like, you know, your typical rock star with a lot of makeup and stuff. They're just very mundane. They have like long hair, you know, it's greasy and dumpy. And I encourage people to have dumpy, greasy hair, you know, like, because I think, like, when, like now, it's very popular to have, you know, short hair and, and blow dried and stuff. So I would encourage people to wear polyester flared pants, to have greasy hair, anything that's out of fashion. I, I admire early 70s fashion a lot because it offends, you know, new wave people. And I think that's important, so. What attracts you to Monday? Mon Monday, well, <clears throat> I think that, see, a lot of art is based on flashiness. It's based on, you know, you know, like movies and stuff, it, like, hit, like rock videos are all, you know, flashy, you know, dynamic. To me, a good rock vi video is one that would be very mundane and show ridiculous point, you know, images that just have nothing to do with the song, boring images. Like I think if the Shags did a video, it would be great because they just filmed them in their living room. There'd be like paneling in the background. You know, it'd be like a suburban place and their father would sing. I just think you gotta get, it, you gotta get art down to a horizontal level, down to the people, so that anyone can, it's like mundane, you know? Like there's something that Jonathan Richmond once said, and this is, sums it up perfectly, he once said, and he said this like in 1974, he said, you have to learn, they asked him about his music, and he said, you have to learn to play with nothing, with your guitars broken and it's raining. And I think that's, that's it, that sums it up. You gotta, 
you got to want to have headaches. Like I, there's a term in practice, a mundane headache. You, you got to want to view the art with a headache, you know. And that's it. <laughs> We, we in Cartoon Dip can never expose the upper half of our body, only the lower. Um, this is a very, uh, this is a very uh, Cartoon Dip picture. Um, I didn't do it. It was done by Bill Post of Conway, New Hampshire. Um, it's very dippy because I think the thing that makes it work is that the person didn't know how to, to, to do it really an oil painting. They sort of knew how to do it but they didn't really, they had a working knowledge of it. Now, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, I mean this as a compliment. The per and I think that's the reason it works, because it's sort of halfway between reality, between really working as an oil painting, and halfway between being a total failure. Now, well, for instance, the head, you can see, uh, that isn't you know, correctly proportioned, and that's good, but it, it could be correctly proportioned. And another good thing about it is that the hair is greasy, it's, it's not at all fashionable or contemporary. And the clothes aren't really contemporary either. And it's, a, you know, it's just a mundane scene. You have like a chair, she's sitting in a chair here. The chair is sort of well painted. And it's a little bit off kilter. I think this would look nice hanging like in a mobile home or in like the shag's living room with like the paneling in the background. That's all I wanted to think. <laughs> I think uh, perhaps a few uh, simple diagrams will be able to explain it better than, than I've you know, been able to explain it. So um, first we're going to discuss the concept of horizontal reality as opposed to, now horizontal reality of course goes in this direction, either way in an unlimited psychic field, either way, as opposed to vertical reality which goes upward or downward, it's a series of up and down uh, motions. Now it's important that you focus on your center psychic bearing, which is right there, and it's important that you focus on your negative psychic energy, which is there, which connects with this psychic field here within the spectrum of your, the engrams on your subconscious mind. Now, Reverend Moon is up here, and he connects to the engrams, which in turn connect with Amway, which is down here. Now, it's important that you focus on Heavenly Father's principle, which is in the center portion there. And it's also important that you stay centered on your center person and chant, pray, and run in order to sell flowers. Now, you have the horizontal reality versus the vertical reality. And a cartoon dip person, this person has one foot here in vertical reality and one foot here in horizontal reality. And it's important that you're able to come to now, which is here. And that, in a nutshell, is what Cartoon Dip is all about. I think that explains it in the concise terms. Thank you.